This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Welcome back to The Forging Table. The mission of Undaunted Life is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. At The Forging Table, you'll see a group of regular guys forging spiritual resilience by digging into God's Word, and we're welcoming all of you to come along on that journey with us. That's Derek, that's Eric, that's Robert, and here's the thing on this one. I normally try to do some funnies and try to make, you know, have a little bit of levity here at the beginning, but there is way too much ground to cover. You guys already knew that if you read up through Matthew 26, so we're just going to launch right in today. So Robert, if you will do Matthew 26, read verses 1. One through five, please. Will do. When Jesus had finished all these things, saying, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So real quick, just a quick note on Caiaphas that I read in the John MacArthur commentary that he served in his role from about 18 AD to 36 AD. And so his long tenure in that position, which apparently had a decent amount of turnover, implies that he had very close ties both to Rome and to Herod. So I thought that was an interesting historical point. But the one thing I wanted to point out here, and again, we we got a lot of ground to cover, so we can't chill here very long. Verse two, you know, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the son of man will be delivered up to be crucified. He tells him this again. This is the fourth time we see in Matthew that he has predicted his death or and his and crucifixion. And yet the apostles were still in shock. Mm-hmm. The disciples were still in shock when it happened. Again, I don't want to hover over the apostles and be like, "Well, if I was back then, I wouldn't mm-hmm. be so stupid because I would have been probably dumber." I am literally Peter in most uh, areas of life, and I don't yeah. mean that in a good way. But like, they missed it. Yeah. Like, I, I just don't understand how they missed it. In retrospect, hearing all the stories, I mean, how many times have we read through the Gospels and you're like, how in the world did you not know what was happening? I mean, it just, it, it amazes me sometimes, but just like it. I mean, if I was there, I'm sure I would have been just as oblivious and going, well, that's another parable I don't right, quite exactly. understand. Just a parable. You know, it's another. Maybe we should ask him to explain that one. Yeah. Yes. Remember the last no, time? No, literally, I'm going to die <laughs> yeah. and raise that's from the dead. That's it. I, I, I. That actually is a pretty decent explanation because I've tried to put myself in their shoes. And if it's like, like, I don't know if someone was like, hey, I'm going to go punch that dude across the street in the face. And then a couple weeks later, dad, that dude across the street, I'm going to smoke him right in the face. And then you do that two more times. And then you watch your buddy walk across the street and smoke that dude in the face. And if you react with, oh my gosh, I can't believe he did that. (laughs) It's like, you you can't believe it. You would have to suspend belief to believe that your friend would do what he said he was going to do. And I I guess the other thing that makes this hard for me is crucifixion was, was the worst, the worst possible death, the worst possible humiliation. The only dignity that they afforded to uh, Jews was that they wouldn't crucify them completely naked. They would allow them to cover their private parts. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, man, so if someone said crucifixion back in that day and they said, that's going to happen to me, that wouldn't be just like a passing statement. I mean, think about it though. If you were a disciple at that time, how many times did you feel stupid around Jesus? Constantly. I mean, how many times was he talking and you didn't have any idea what he was talking about? And then later on you were like, oh, uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It I was the it. stupid one that said I wanted to be the greatest and I got reamed for it. I, yeah. I, to the point that I probably would have been not, not completely silenced, but I probably wouldn't ask as many stupid questions. That's good. That's really funny. And that's a good point as well, because again, I know I give a lot of shout outs to the chosen, but there are several scenes in the chosen where they have Jesus saying this thing and he's saying it and there's a little bit of music in the background and then the music stops, camera goes to the disciples and it's a bunch of blank stares and they just kind of start looking at each other. And I'm like, yes, yes, that's exactly how it was. Cause they had no clue. But again, yeah. if you read the Bibles, if there is no personality in any of that in there, you're going to miss all that entirely. But we got to move on here. So let's get to the story of Jesus being anointed at Bethany. So Eric, if you will read six through 13, please. Sure. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon, the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of, inex- of expensive ointment and poured it. She poured it on his head and re- as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, 
I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, uh, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So this is Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus. Um, This is a similar act that we see described in Luke 7, but the timing implies that this was a different occasion that he got this. And, you know, I read a bunch of different commentaries about this to where some people, well, essentially no one I read thought that she did this on purpose to anoint his body for burial. (laughs) That that she didn't do that knowingly. She didn't knowingly get that ointment and think, I'm going to go ahead and get him ready because he's going to stinketh uh, after they put him in the tomb. Like, I don't think that they they thought that, but she just did it. There was something in here, in her, the Holy Spirit perhaps that was kind of pushing her and moving her to do that. Uh, there's some fulfillment of prophecy in there. But I mean, what she did is she broke, you know, a, a jar of ointment that was a year's salary essentially. So guys, think about whatever your salary is or whatever the generic salary, average salary is in a you know, country like America. That's what she did to, to anoint him. And um, a few ways we can talk about this, but I'll just kind of go, with, go off the fly here. I would have been right there with the apostles being like, what is this dumb woman doing? Like she, sure. she obviously didn't buy that because she just broke it like it was nothing. But it's just like the <laughs> posture of the apostles. <laughs> that was like a disappointed laugh. Like that would be a laugh that you would give your son when he said something so ratchet and stupid, Eric. <laughs> oh, I don't, I have no idea. Sorry to disappoint you, know. you dad. No, but like, weird. that's, that's the thing that I, again, I don't ever want to put myself above and hover above the apostles because I feel like I would have been that person as well because these guys were in a business mindset because, yeah. you know, people lose sight that their ministry costs money. Like they had to pay for places to stay sometimes, had to pay for food a lot of times, mm-hmm. and they raised money and did business deals to keep their ministry going for three years. And so this is almost a continuation of that mindset, and they missed the whole point of yeah. what happened here. I'm yeah, sure and it looks like in um, in John 12, that Judas was the one that was the most indi- yeah. indignant. And it makes me wonder if that was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back kind yeah, of thing. that's a good point. Uh, we just like, look, that that's it can't this is i can't, yeah, I can't yeah. this is this too anymore. much yeah. this, is, this is too lavish right you know that we're doing here right this this we're on a shoestring budget that could have carried us for how many months with how many people a year maybe and that that could have got us right. and you just wasted that by putting it on your feet yeah. i didn't realize yeah. that women wore that that perfume around their neck on the sabbath so that that would have been know. something she potentially was wearing hmm. okay. um maybe she wasn't but that was something that i think that was traditional and she may have even just done it on a whim where right. she was just over so overcome by the presence of Jesus, yeah. which haven't we all kind of been there at least at some point in our lives where we were just so overcome by the presence of Jesus that mm. we did things that, you know, when we were more sober minded, I, I guess you could say where we maybe potentially wouldn't do something like that, but that's obviously very important. One quick thing before we move on to verse 14, I wanted to point out again, that stack of lovely books there at the end of the table. We have partnered with Crossway for those of you that want to start your own forging table. So that is the forging table starter set. It's got a men's Bible. It's got a scripture journal there, the book of Romans. It's got a devotional. It's got a book about the different types of writing in the Bible. And then also a great book for men that want to be family shepherds. There's a three-step process. It's here in the show notes about how you can get that at 50% off. So go to the show notes. If you want to get that set of books, that amazing set of books for 50% off. And now we need to get into a furtherance of the story of Judas, as uh, you were just talking about, Eric. So Derek, if you can read verses 14 through 16, as we get into this betrayal. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. I have several questions here. We can't camp on all of them for too long. But here's my first question about this very, very short section of scripture. Is did Judas willingly do this or was he predestined to? (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, because I wrote that down in my notes and immediately went, I need to scratch that out. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that one, but no, let's deal with it. Let's well here, here, there are several theories as to what, what he was doing and and why, what his motive was. And the one that I thought was interesting is maybe he wanted to force Jesus into the conquering Messiah. Um, he, 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 maybe I'm sure they all were looking of course for the conquering Messiah and he was just not, it was not getting to that point quick enough for him. And so if, uh, I wonder if not, if he wasn't trying to force the issue on that. In essence, he wanted to force God into his will um, rather than to uh, put himself into God's will. Or in that same vein, if they wanted, if he wanted to remove him because they saw how many people were following, you know, they wanted a militant Messiah. That's who they were That's praying they for, yeah, right. you know, and when they found out for sure, he is not the militant Messiah. And 
everybody is believing that he is the Messiah. And so I need to remove him so that they aren't swayed in yet another fraction doctrine and are people divided even more. And if I remove him, then it'll allow for when the militant Messiah does come, we can be more unified. And, yeah. And I'm going to answer your question with the best uh, information that I have. It, I would just think of him as Pharaoh. And I, I, I feel like God hardened his heart at that moment to do the thing that he had planned for him yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would, again, that gets into that great Charles, Charles Spurgeon quote, which has been read on this podcast several times about that, that tension between free will and God's sovereignty. And, you know, I think if someone says he willingly did it, it's like, yes, or he was predestined to do it. And it's like, yes, also, Mm -hmm. it almost feels like one of those things. And I think you kind of brought that up. One thing that I did find interesting, and I'd never heard this before, 30 pieces of silver is the same penalty from the old Testament when an ox gored a servant to death. The penalty that was paid, that's Exodus 2132. The penalty paid was 30 pieces of silver. Thought that that was interesting. But then also, that was roughly the same price as a slave would have cost during that time period. Exactly right. So I thought yeah. that was very interesting because he almost like knowingly became a slave to his personal desires, to who he thought Jesus might have been, to the Sanhedrin. Like he became a slave in that moment. Last question on this section that I just want to kind of throw out to the table is Did Jesus, or did Judas rather ever believe in Jesus? Did he ever actually believe in Jesus? Did he lose his faith? This gets into that. Hey, mm-hmm. are you once saved, always saved? Can an elect lose his salvation? Can someone believe in Jesus and then fall away? Can they deconstruct? Can they, you know, just become an apostate? Is that even possible? Did Judas ever actually believe in Jesus? Yeah, great question. I, hard for me to know. Yeah, you know, right? I, I find like, Go ahead, Derek. I'm sorry. No, I don't think I was just in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it hard to believe that Judas would have left everything in order to follow Jesus unless he himself at the moment felt it. That he was worthy of following. And then seeing the miracles that were done, reaffirming through his eyes how many miracles that we don't know about, just the ones that were listed that we do. How could he have not in yeah, some way? I mean, I don't, I'm just sitting here trying to write like who, where was he in the order of the number of uh, disciples that were called? Was he 10th, 11th, 12th? Did he potentially go, well, man, there's a following kind of brewing here. Maybe there's an opportunity here. If he's going to be the Messiah, the conquering king, maybe I can get in his court, make some money. I literally Power wrote here. down. Yeah opportunist whenever yeah. uh before you got to saying that because i'm sensitive to your argument robert but in my head i think to myself like he proves himself to be an opportunist he proves himself to think that chip perhaps the chips are down and he's like dude i can feel the pressure of rome and the sanhedrin crushing down on us right now i gotta get mm-hmm. my golden parachute or silver parachute as it were mm-hmm. yeah. and maybe that's maybe this is my time and mm-hmm. it's like hey you know I love Jesus. I love these other disciples and all that, but he's, it's probably a better chance that they're just going to kill him and that he's not going to overtake Rome. Cause maybe he just did an, a, an evaluation, like a coach's evaluation. Like we do not have the personnel to win this football game now. Mm-hmm. Like we are just, it, we're down by too much and we don't have enough talent on the bench. Like it's what, what was it? Uh, I don't know if it's John Calipari, or Pat Riley, to where it's like, Hey, look, look at the doors, of the locker room. There's not another team coming in here. That's going to save you guys. It's just y'all. And so maybe he was just doing an evaluation and yeah. thinking to himself, like, this is it. Like I got to get out now. Yep. Yeah. Hard to know, but that, that, that seems plausible. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next section here. Let's keep this moving. Passover with the disciples. So Robert 17 through 25. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the 12. And as they were eating, he said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another is it i lord he answered he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me the son of man goes as it is written of him but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it would have been better for that man if he had not yet been born 
Judas, who had betrayed him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Just an unbelievably dramatic moment. Again, I encourage you guys, stop reading the Bible like these are robots. Stop reading it like a robot yourself. Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. And moving on with your life. No. Can you imagine the drama? Like, so if you read verse 21 again, that's, and you know, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Can you imagine the pit in Judas's stomach? Because in that exact moment, he knew it was him. Yeah. There, like, he wasn't thinking to himself, oh, I wonder who could it be? <laughs> like, everyone else was wondering, and I bet you he was playing along. I bet you he was like, oh, gosh, what a shocking statement to have heard for the first time ever. Like, the, the pit, because I don't know about you guys, maybe you don't have the same, you know, ginger, you know, inner conscience as me where you just get nervous about, you know. I saw, I literally saw the principal of my kid's school in my Sunday school class today. And I, I immediately thought, what did my son do? He's three, he's three years old. He didn't try to set the place on fire, but that's immediately where my head went. Like she can't be here because she wants to worship Christ and be in our group. It's because my son's in trouble. So I just, I remember this, these feelings of dread and doom and having those several times through my life. And I feel like I could combine all of those together and put them into one emotion and it wouldn't have been anything close to what Judas felt in that moment. Yeah. So it's not possible. Yeah. You know, I, about, uh, would it be 20 years ago or about 10 years? So from 10 to 20 years ago, we were in Southeast Kansas. We've been here in Oklahoma city about 10 years. And when I was there, I, uh, I played Jesus in a cantata play Whoa. that was done about once every two years. So it was like five times over 10 years, I played Jesus. And I mean, so it was very well-known production in that area. It was a massive undertaking. We practiced for like five months to prepare. I mean, I would say the majority of the local communities, you know, cities that were 15 miles away and whatnot, they all came. Did you grow your hair out real long and Dude, lock, long like locks? A, it was a fro, man. I'm Do telling you, we it was have the, pictures? It was, the, it was the turn the head and your hair follows. It was Woo! kind of one of those, man. It was flowing, flowing locks. Nice. Yeah, beard was just, I mean, it, it was banging, buddy. It was way down there because I would grow it out for an entire year, which is the reason why I've always just kept it since. You know, my kids mm. just got used to it. And so I always had to grow it out for the next play. It took so long to be able to get everything where it needed to be. Anyways, as soon as I start moving into this portion the betrayal, leading into the garden, leading into the torture, the crucifixion. Man, it just takes me back. It takes me back to what would be the equivalent of five months, five times, all of those times of trying to just do the best I could to show the, to show the strength of Jesus, the resolve of Jesus, the emotion that he went through during that time, but doing it for so many years of embodying that. So anyways, it's kind of off the tail end, but that's just where my mind's at yeah. right now. Well, just there's so much heightened cool emotion here because this is the night before the crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah. You right. lose that when you read, like a lot of people read where they read once and then they pick it up in a day or two or a week or two or a month or two or a decade or two. Like you kind of lose the fact that, no, 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 in a few hours, mm -hmm. things are going to yeah. start falling apart for Jesus in terms of his personal safety. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the second time I meant to mention it earlier, but this is just as good. Um, earlier, when we were reading, and the the priest, the high priest, was like, "Hey, let's let's not kill him during the feast. Uh, there might yeah. be an uproar." Uh, and then down here, when Jesus says, um, "Yeah, you you said so. This is it's it's you." Uh, it, we we see that that Jesus is a hundred percent in control of this entire situation because they don't want to kill him on that day, but he gets killed on that day because yep. that's the way he wanted it. He, he knew who was going to uh, betray him before he betrayed him, and he was going to call him out for it. Um, and, we, and I think it continues on. I mean, as we, when he says, Peter, hey, you're going to deny me, it happens. Yep. You know, um, yep. He was in complete and utter control. When he says, it's my time, the time is near, let's do it, it's because he knew. Uh, so, I mean, just the sovereignty uh, of, the, of that moment, it, there was nothing that was ever out uh, that was chaotic on Jesus and he was never caught off guard. It was all happening exactly the way it was planned out the way it was supposed to be. Yeah. I never noticed this before reading prior, uh, but it's like this clandestine like spot. He's got this Passover uh, mm -hmm. going to and uh, reading the note. Uh, let me find it again. Sorry. Uh, evidently he made these arrangements clandestinely in order to prevent his premature burial. 
uh, or betrayal uh, by Judas. So yeah, like you said, he's in control of everything. He's got it down to the minute, the second. Because of Judas, how it's going to happen? Yeah, if yeah. he knew it was going to happen there, he'd do it there instead yeah. of the garden. And he had to have that moment. You yeah. know, and look at what happened during the Passover feast, right? You know, I mean, literally every month at our church, we're still today and how many churches around the globe are every Sunday yeah. still going through that exact same representation of what he did and the significance of those moments. Absolutely. Eric, if you will hit the institution of the Lord's Supper, that is 26 through 29. Right on. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat this is my body and he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink <clears throat> drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins i tell you i will not drink it again of this fruit of the vine until that day when i drink it new with you in my father's kingdom so we could have obviously spent the entire time on any of these sections there's so many more sections left to go this is the final sacrifice. This is the fulfillment of Old Testament law uh, and prophecy. Um, but one thing I did want to point out here is because, you know, Catholic doctrine and his, you know, their history shows that, you know, this is, I forget what the name of the, the what it is, but it's where this actually did turn into Jesus's body whenever you were taking it and those mm-hmm. types of things. There's not even a hint of that here in the text, which again gives <clears throat> credence to when people make the point that Catholic um, belief is scripture plus church history plus church fathers plus a bunch of other stuff whereas protestantism essentially is just what does the text say and there's nothing here that says that the you know it transmutes or whatever into an actual flesh so derek if you will hit verse 30 through 35 and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the mount of olives then jesus said to them you will all fall away because of me this night for it is written I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die, even even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. My first note I wrote on the section is, you know, Peter is cocksure, but he is cowardly. And I mean, he was so sure of himself. Like if you could have asked him a million times, he would have answered in the affirmative that, no, I'm not going to do this. There's no way. And then he just does. And it just makes you wonder what changed in Peter's heart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, how in the world would that have happened? I mean, I, I think this one is the hardest one for me to think of is, you know, for Jesus hours earlier to say, you will all betray me. And None of them would have ever even imagined doing hours earlier. You know, this isn't weeks or days. Or, you know, this is just a few hours that they had to wait. And then every one of them systematically do. You know, yeah, it's crazy. You know, I got uh, right out of the gate on, on 30. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I, I, the, if I was Jesus about to be arrested and crucified, I don't know that singing would be on my radar screen. And, and yet there was something very powerful about this. Apparently it was tradition to sing Psalms 116 through 118 called the Hillel. And um, I won't read it because it doesn't matter. But if you were to go look, look at, one, at, at chapter 116 verses 3 and 4, 8 and 9, 13 through 15, 117 verses 1, and then 118, 13, 14, 17 through 18, 22 through 23, and 27 to 28. It's all prophetic. Um, it's all speaking to the coming Christ and his crucifixion. Uh, pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, I can see now why they would have sung it. But <clears throat> that's, that to me was amazing. Uh, but, yeah, I agree with you. Um, what, like, what in the world happened? I mean, we, you see down lower where he, he tries, to, tries to do something, cutting off somebody's ear. But um, spoiler alert! I'm sorry, <laughs> not even there yet. Happened, yeah, I, I think I think what happened here maybe isn't as much a change of heart as it was just a revealing of who he really was in that moment. Because we all know that guy, that guy that's definitely going to do the thing. Oh, I got it! I got this squared away. It's going to blow. It just doesn't happen, yeah. right? Or man, if anybody came over here, I mean, you probably see this in the military, Derek. But it's just like, gosh, if I get the chance, and I've heard a lot of you know guys in the Marine Corps and all that, the dudes in boot camp that just can't wait. 
to get their rifle and get over there and freaking kill those terrorists and blah, blah. Those are the guys pissing their pants in the bottom of the tank. Yeah. Because they can't, like, they can't deal with, you know, the bullets flying and, you know, it just, it reveals who they are as opposed to changes them into something different. Yeah. And Jesus hadn't said it yet, but this is clearly a, another representation of the spirit being willing, but the flesh being weak, yeah. you know, I Absolutely. Mean, you could say all you want, but man, in the moment, what are you going to do? Well, let's go to the garden. Who read last? Uh, I did. Robert, if you would hit the garden of Gethsemane, that is 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch with me just one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So the word Gethsemane is means the crushing or oil press. There's a lot of different things, but when you consider what's happening here, think about the pressure that Jesus had to have felt because he was fully man, right? Mm-hmm. Fully God and fully man, something that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But he was feeling the pressure of this moment because there's no way he couldn't have. Eric, certainly he was um, aware of all this, but... He was still checking, like, hey, is this what has to happen? Like, God, is this, you know, Father, is this what has to happen? And you could tell by the end there, like, he calmly accepts his decision and uh, the Father's will. But, again, it's kind of hard to say he was in consternation because he is, he is God. He's part of the triune. But, like, again, he's still experiencing this as a man would and as evidenced by the fact that he experienced the, the pain of what was to befall him very soon. Yeah, Jeremiah twenty five fifteen talks about drink that Jesus is going to have to drink the the cup of God's fury. Um, I didn't, I never put that those t- uh, the, the passage of Matthew um, together with that before, but um, I just wrote down that Jesus was more concerned with God's judgment than he was with death. Like he could reckon with death, but uh, he didn't particularly want to have to take on God's judgment and his fury. Yet he was willing. And what is he weighing? You know, I mean, when you look at what was on the scale, he, I think he knew the true measure that he was going to have to suffer. I think he truly knew exactly the extent he was going to be beat, the crucifixion, what all was entailed for him. But then on the other hand, he knew that not only was it God's fury that was there, but it was the redemption of all mankind. As his sacrifice would allow from now on all of us to have direct communion with the Father. I mean, that's, you know, to weigh one suffering over, you know, the, the scale and where he was. I mean, that's just, I can't imagine it's powerful. Well, and we can see that the, the cross was won in the garden because yeah. he prayed, <clears throat> he asked for the cup if it could be removed to be removed. It was not going to be. Um, and so he, he pre-decided and he's like, okay, this, it's, it's done. This is what we're doing. I'm going forward with this. So there was no in the moment as he's about to get nailed or to the cross. We're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. No, it was just, this is, this is how it is. And not it's, to be lost here is the, the actions of the disciples here. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, my, oh, go ahead. If you got something to say on that, well, but it's just, just like, yeah. you know, Peter, James, and John, it's like, good, good Lord. Three stooges. <laughs> it was just kind of stuck out to me. It's like, he comes back, they're asleep. He's like, okay. And he goes back, comes back again, sleeping again. And it's like, these are like, like you talk about your foxhole guys. I think probably he's selected these three to go back there with him. And he's going through this extremely, you know, difficult time. Maybe he's coming out to talk to these guys to like give them some encouragement or something, but now nah, they're asleep. Or maybe uh, he needed them. Well, he did yeah. need them. He's like, I just need y'all to stand by and pray for me. Why yeah. go up there and freaking suffer? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, not that, I mean, like we said earlier, obviously I'd probably be doing the same thing these guys are doing. I'm tired. I'm falling asleep. But 
it's it's hard to it reminds me of Job whenever his friends came and you know, and, and Job I'm sure Job at first was like, Oh, my friends are gonna come console me. Yeah. You know, and then they just betrayed him with their words of like, Well, what'd you do, man? Well what, that's what's your problem? Again, there's a lot of emotion in those words and there's gotta be emotion here in verse forty. Yeah. So so you could not watch with me one hour. <laughs> oh, come on, guys, you can watch with me one hour. Is that how you think he said it? Is no. that how you think you guys said it? It's like could you guys not watch with for one hour for one hour? I want you guys to just be there for me in prayer, right? And again, we don't know that because we don't have the, the tone of what's happening here, but contextually, it wouldn't make sense that he would just be casually like, oh gosh, I can't believe you guys didn't do that. It's very, very disappointing. If I was, if I had an anger issue, I, I swear I'd run you guys out of here with a whip or something like that. Um, so let's keep this going. We're going to get to the actual betrayal and arrest of Jesus now. So Eric, you have the horrible honors of reading this terrible account. So 47 through 56. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, One of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew the sword and struck a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. There's a lot here. Verse 47, um, whenever Matthew describes Judas, Judas, he doesn't just say Judas, he says Judas came, one of the twelve. So this really underscores uh, treachery. That's how the ESV study Bible puts it. It's just it really underscores his treachery. Um the Greek word used whenever Jesus said friend in verse 50 implies that Judas is now considered as an acquaintance, not a close personal connection anymore. So I thought that that was an interesting note. I, I forget which commentary said that, but yes, so the, the Greek word there is just, you know, hey, person, hey, buddy, like, you know, come and do what, what you've come here to do. But I wanted to park oh, on verse 52 there for a second. You know, when Jesus repudiates Peter for cutting off Malchus's ear, you know, put your sword back in its place for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Uh, there are a lot of morons that think this is a repudiation of self-defense. Um, obviously, it's not. Wow. This is Jesus saying to Peter, you're in the way. Yeah. Get out of the way. Like, my father's will needs to be done. You are currently in the way. Can you please stop it? But the ESV Study Bible had a, a really interesting note here, and it's that true disciples of Jesus do not seek to advance or impose God's will on others through violent means. Paging Islam. But that's an interesting note here to where it's like, hey, we're not going to do what needs to happen here by forcing it upon people. We're not going to give them the option of paying a tax, uh, you know, being killed or having something, you know, taken off of them, right? Like those aren't the options, right? Or I guess the other option would be conversion. It's just like, no, this is not the will of the father to force people to do this. And so uh, I thought that that was an interesting note from that commentary. It makes me wonder if Peter, when he said, I will never betray you, I'm going into the battle with you. And he thought at that moment is like, oh, okay, this is it. This is when the conqueror comes out and I'm grabbing my sword. I'm going to be the first guy. Let's go. And then now that's not how we're doing it. And I think, I wonder if his spirit spirit um, was crushed in that moment where he was like, oh, crap, this is not what I thought. What if, what if this leads to his denial to where this entire right. time for three years, he's like, Jesus is going, he's, he's going to be a conquering general. Right. Yeah. And then in this exact moment, he's ready to go into battle and yeah. the general says, no, it's not going to be this exactly. way. And perhaps he is just absolutely flummoxed because imagine thinking somebody was one thing for three years and in an instant they show you no that's not it that's not me like the amount of jaded that Mm -hmm, he had to have been that may perhaps that leads to the fact that he was close enough to be able to see jesus here just in a moment but far enough away to be like i don't know what to think anymore yeah no i'm not with that guy yeah Yeah. 
Yeah. And he handled his business. I mean, he was the only one that pulled a sword, right? It was him and Jesus. Everybody else pulled back against how many soldiers that was there. I mean, you know, yeah. and then for Jesus to sit there and tell him, rebuke him in the middle of battle. I mean, you I, wouldn't expect that. I can't imagine the shaking. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's great redemption. You know, see Peter cut off the ear with a sword. Uh, but later on, yeah, through just being redeemed, he's able to pierce hearts with the gospel. You yeah. Know, so, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it, there is a good ending to the story, but in that moment, that's a very low point. There typically is a good ending for those that are called by the, by God. So uh, next guy up, if you'll hit 57 through 68. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you, the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered uttered blasphemy. What further witness do you need? You have now heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and stuck him, struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is it that struck you? So this all occurred under cover of darkness, which was not to be permitted, but it was done anyway. Um, I really want to focus in initially here on verses 63 and 64, because people will read verse, they read these two verses and say, See? Jesus was given a chance to say he was, you know, the son of God, that he was divine, and he didn't do it. But it's a complete misread of these two scriptures, because the way they read it is they read verse 40, 64 this way. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but that, that's not it. This is a direct confirmation. We see this in how language is structured in the original Aramaic with which it would have been spoken in, the Greek and, and Hebrew and Latin that it would have been, you know, written down on in the first century. and The thing is here is him being silent to a degree is a fulfillment of prophecy. So as we see in Isaiah 53, 7, um, I meant to bring that up. I'll bring it up here in a second just to read it. Um, They wanted Jesus to admit out loud that he had done these things so that they could charge him with insurrection. And so he stayed silent. Are you going to look that up for me? Uh, Yeah, when he is led like like a lamb to the slaughter. Yeah. So kept his mouth silent. Yeah, kept his mouth silent and the other thing is that's implied here, and I had never heard anyone talk about this before. His silence implies that he thinks if he had spoken up that he would have been acquitted. Because again, they're, you know, this will eventually go before the people. They weren't going to be able to execute him in complete secrecy. They could do this part in secret. But it's like if he spoke up in his own defense, like especially considering the timing that these guys didn't even want this to be happening while there was all the crowds. I think they were making a, a calculation here and that he was also, he's fulfilling prophecy, but making the calculation that I can't fulfill my father's will if I get acquitted because the time is now. Right. I mean, and there are so many illegalities, if that's the word. Illegalities? Illegalities. Thank you. You were close. I went to school. (laughs) Uh, That happened in that. I mean, if this had happened in our courts, you know, you'd think it'd just be thrown out. It's like, doesn't doesn't count. Um, But Jesus, you know, in that time, they didn't have lawyers. There weren't like prosecution lawyers and defense lawyers. It was just literally witnesses coming um, to either testify on your behalf or against you. Uh, and it looked like they found two. Uh, and I think the, the legal way to do this for the judge was that those two could not have any collaboration with one another. They had to be heard completely separate, which apparently didn't happen here. But you're right. Jesus could have called witnesses. I mean, how many witnesses did he have that he yeah. had? I mean, people did he heal thousands? Yeah, yeah. Upon right thousands, there in the city. Yeah. Right. That he could have called and he did not for the exact reason that uh, it was his time. He knew what needed to happen. Yeah, it needed to be under cover of darkness in order for God's will to be done and for his to drink the cup that had to be done. So any other way would have, you know, would have not have thought about God's will in it. So And now we get to see Peter act out in his jaded nature. nature. So let's close it out, whoever's up next, uh, 69 through the end of chapter 26. That's verse 75. 
Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with the Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself, and to swear, I do not know the man, and immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I mean, I can't even really put myself into that position of feeling like he felt. Um, with, but with Peter disavowing Jesus, I'm actually looking at it here in Luke. Um, Luke records that uh, Peter disowning Jesus, that's Luke, uh, what is it, sorry, Luke 22, verses 54 through 62. But it basically says that Luke, or it says that Peter and Jesus made eye contact. And that's depicted in the Passion of the Christ. Yep. And it is just like, there's no corollary, I don't think. Like, I, I can't think of a single thing or moment in my life that could have something even close to that because I guess I don't have, some people are just betrayers by nature. They're just very hard to depend on. And it's just, you know, they just betray people all the time. They're just wretched. But this is one of those moments where it's like, I can't really get down with that. Now, this has been interesting to have this conversation to where, G, where Peter's mindset is at where he was thinking Jesus or who he was thinking Jesus was for three years. Because again, obviously everybody missed the thread. They missed all the signs of, nope, this isn't going to be a military coup. Nope, it's not going to be a military coup. It's going to be a spiritual one. So it's like, you got to have to give Peter a break here, but he denies him. But then after that third denial, he makes eye contact with Jesus. And are, are they right next to each other? Are they close enough to where they could have like whispered something to each other? Are they, you know, separated by 50 yards, but they could still see each other, make eye contact and know what's being communicated in that moment. It's just like, what an overwhelming scene. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, you know, that is this rock bottom. Does he, is he hitting rock bottom at that moment? So he, as he goes out and wept Webs, bitterly. Yeah. Is that because in that moment he's like, what have I done? He truly is a son of God, and I just, he just, you know, he, that, that that what he said just came to fruition. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but uh, I mean, if he did hit rock bottom, he stayed there until the resurrection. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, everything that he saw after that, the disparity, you know, the everyone beginning to disband or in almost about to disband between the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know, they're meeting like, what do we do now? You know, I, I can't imagine the disparity that he was in in that moment. Yeah. And I mean, guys, we are marching our way towards the end here, but Derek, go ahead and give us your thoughts there. Uh, kind of on the same subject, uh, listen to a John MacArthur sermon recently, and it was about the tale, it's called The Tale of Two Disciples, and it kind of goes into Peter and Judas and how both were uh, personally selected by Jesus to be disciples. Uh, they're taught by Jesus, saw his power, saw his miracles, both denied him. One, uh, you can see wept bitterly after he denies him, and then one goes out, uh, betrays him, and then commits suicide eventually. Um, and then it kind of goes into Peter and how he's redeemed through the whole thing, and uh, like his name is praised. He's like a super great uh, uh, saint in the faith. And Judas, like you won't even do- you won't even name your dog Judas. Like it's a name like you're not that's not to be spoken. Basically, it's right. just kind of an interesting uh, take on it. Yeah, that is. Yeah, can you imagine naming a kid Judas? Oh, man. No. Like, like, there's not even, I don't even know, like, culturally, it probably goes across different languages. Like, whatever that name is meant to even correlate with, if it even sounds like Judas, like, you can't even name a kid Pubis or something like that. It's like, <laughs> not that, we can't do it, it's too close. But um, I will say, as we wrap up our discussion of Matthew 26, make sure you guys are read through Matthew 27, okay? Because next week, we're going to blow your mind. Because we got a very, very special guest that is going to be with us here at the forging table. You hush your mouth, Eric. I'm not telling anybody. (laughs) But if you've listened all the way here to the end of Matthew 26, you're you're going to get a little bit of a treat here because for the closing two chapters of Matthew, Matthew 27 and 28, 
I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to do it. I was going to think about it. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do it. I will not be pressured. I will not be peer pressured, guys. What you do, if you are behind it, let's say you're chilling out in Matthew 11, you get caught up this week because it'll be worth it because we got a very, very special guest that is flying in. Ooh. Flying it. Doesn't and that sound fancy? his name rhymes with? Not going to say that. Oh, Tulsa. Not going to say that. He's coming from Tulsa? Yeah, he's coming from Lawton, Oklahoma. <laughs> oh. uh, only people in Oklahoma will know how ratchet of a suggestion that is. Shout out to my hometown. But guys, all kidding aside, very, very special guest coming in to be a part of what we have going on here. It is somebody that has been following what we've been doing, is sold out to the mission of Undaunted Life, loves the forging table, and uh, we are so, so happy to have this person come here to help us do the last two weeks of of Matthew, and then we'll go on from there. But we're going to have to leave it there for today. Make sure you're read through Matthew 27 for next week so you're ready to go. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Don't forget about the Crossway, the Forging Table Starter Set. You can check that all out here. All the explanations and instructions are all here in the show notes. You can check that out, but also our donation page. Guys, if you don't know, if you've just been wondering this whole time, how is it that they pull these things off? How is it that they have a electricity to the studio. How is it that Kyle was able to fix that light a couple of weeks ago and not have to go into debt? It's because we have donors. It's because we have guys just like you that are sold out to our mission. You want to be equipped to be able to push back darkness and you want us to be able to do the same with men around the globe. The only way we're currently able to do that is because we have donors hopping in on a monthly basis to hook us up with coins so that we can turn that into I don't know, what would we turn that into? Just amazingly positive things that can be used for the kingdom, guys. Hop positive on board. Positive and encouraging? Positive and encouraging. <laughs> I, don't, I, I can't do it. I just can't bring myself to do it. Guys, commercial over. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetual which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>